Um, in this, uh, I don't know if I want to even call it a series, this is the last week of, of kind of talking, and I told you that it had been a while since I got up here to speak, and that I needed God to just kind of help work some things through with me, and I don't really have a desire anymore to wow you people with messages, you know, um, to be like, oh, that was amazing. I can't believe it. Look at people cried afterwards or whatever it is that pastors do to, to judge how things are going. The goal of the body getting together, the reason that we got out of our homes, drove across town on a rainy day is so that we can sit in God's presence. That's it. So we can be in God's presence, but we can be in God's presence together. And so today what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about how to put ourselves in God's presence, but we're not just going to talk because like we've been saying for the last few weeks, it, it makes no sense to say, here, here's a sermon about how to get in God's presence, go be well, right? <laughs> it's not something you talk about, it's something you experience. And so today, again, what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about the experience of it. Um, we're going to experience it ourselves. And, and then hopefully you just keep carrying it home. And, and maybe we can disrupt church a little bit. Maybe we can demand a little bit more of it instead of saying, hey, I'm totally comfortable with my little corner and showing up sitting here and three songs, two quick discussions, a message, a song, and you go home. Maybe my heart wants more than that. Maybe it's okay to turn around and figure out who the person is behind me right, to stop and to pray for people in this room or to open myself up to saying, you know what, God doesn't operate on a timetable. <laughs> it's okay to just sit and, and find him um, because I, I believe, guys, that, that this gathering should be us coming together and saying, God is good. How did your week go? Oh, that's amazing. You had that opportunity you shared there. I'm sorry you're hurting there. What, how can we pray for you here, right? And we come together and we build, we, the Bible says, encourage, literally, we give courage to one another to just go out and, and, and live another week in God's presence, right? And if he meant us to do that alone, he would have developed a completely different planet. <laughs> so... We're going to try that. I'm just going to say a quick prayer that what takes place in here is actually God speaking and, and not what it's been before. So, Lord, we've given you our worship and we desire your presence. We desire to place ourselves, to take our spirit and, and put it in your presence. And we know that that is so simple. And so right now, I, I choose to do that. And I know others in this room are choosing to do that, just simply saying, God, I choose to be with you. I choose to be where you are, and as we put ourselves in your presence, God, I pray that we, um, we are open to the fullness of the living God, to taste of all of the goodness that is there, that you take that inner being, that heart, that core of us, peel back the layers, knock down the walls, and just let us spend some time with you. And it's in your name I pray, amen. So... Here's how we discussed that. The first week we said it's important to seek God's presence. Not just as, um, hey, you know what? We should do that every now and then, and that will be encouraging to you. Like the Bible says, this is where you need to live. You need to live in God's presence. And so we just tried to knock down some lies that have existed, which is Christianity is a bunch of highs and lows. It's a bunch of ups and downs, and you have your close moments with God, and then you have your moments where God is very, very far away, because that is just, this is just really not true. We want to just go back to a simple faith where God's at the door knocking, and I just get to open each day, step in, spend time with him, right? I, I don't have to go, you know, it, when I sin, when I struggle, when, I, when shame wants to push me far from God's presence, I don't need to go do 25 good things in order to get back in his good graces. I just need to simply come home. And like scripture says, he's the one that throws the party each day. <laughs> each day I come home, he puts the robe on me, he puts the ring on my finger, and he says, my son, my son is here. 
And I'm like, but da, da, don't you know what I did this week and the thoughts that were in my head? And he's too busy planning the party because my sin is as far as the east is from the west, Scripture says. And, and the, the truth that we have started to uncover is that all of the Bible, all of it that seems so confusing and filled with rules and regulations makes sense when we just put ourselves in God's presence first. So to illustrate that, we began with... Now, let's see if I can lift this. I'm getting a lot older. Okay. We do that early in the service to make sure everybody's awake, right? And then if I see people dozing off, we'll just pick them up and drop them again, right? No, so what we did is we said that here's our illustration. Now, I'm even going to take it a step further this week. I'm going to lock it together, okay? Now, it's the biggest chain we could find in Pocatello, at least with the budget that we were operating on. But if we were talking about God's presence and God's love, we'd be talking about something huge, right? Scripture says nothing can separate us from it. Nothing. Like it is the, it is the, the giant one where just a single ring, right, is like a thousand pounds and, and you're not going to break it, okay? And you get to put yourself in God's presence. And you step into God's presence. And the scripture uses lots of different ways to, to illustrate this. We said that um, Paul likes to talk about it as this, this strong binding that God puts upon us. Right? That we are bound to him in Romans 8. And we just can't get away from it. And so we use the illustration of the chain. And we talked about how John, he likes to refer to it as this massive light. Right? And it's this just amazing beam that you step into and everything is illuminated. And, and so we have to use our imaginations a little bit, but since we live in a day and age where they can just CGI anything, okay, we can picture then that here is this amazing space that is lit up, that is bright, that is amazing, that is filled with, it's just, it's just radiating power, Right? And you and I get to step into it. And stepping into it, a little intimidating at first. Okay? Um, okay, I'm allowed to go here. Like the Old Testament, to do that killed me. But because of Jesus, I get to do this freely. Right? There's no more boundary before God and man. And so I can step into God's presence. But here's what happens. If I'm going to step into that amazing presence, I am going to be overwhelmed by that crazy beam of light, that power of his love. Like the core definition of God we, done, we discussed, like you, you take the Bible and you boil it down to the most simple factor. It says God is love. And, and if we pull love out of the equation, we talked about how this book is just one horribly scary story. <laughs> None of it makes sense. But if you talk about an agape love, a love that says it's not based on you at all, it's just based on the goodness of the giver, that you can step into this no matter what you've done, and you will be overwhelmed with how much you are cared for, with the thoughts that God has for you, but yet you're in this crazy intense beam, and it calls, and it commands, and it demands something of you. It's almost as if, as I step into God's presence, he says, you can come in here, but everything else needs to stay on the outside. The negative thoughts that you have about yourself, the sin that you've been struggling with, the the things, the possessions, the stuff that you want to grab a hold of and you own, it doesn't fit in here, right? And if you try to bring it in, God's presence is so intense, it melts those things away. And it says they don't matter anymore. And you just, you just find yourself humbled, like 
knocked down to your knees, kind of humbled in God's presence. This is good. This is so good, and I am okay right here. But because this is so intense, because it, it just it, it scares us, and it's hard to imagine a world where I am good enough, and I don't have to do something, where it's not based on my effort, because everything seems to be based on the effort that we put into it. Every relationship, every job, every interaction, and Satan is reminding us every day of all of our failures and all the times when we don't add up and we match up. And so we sit here and it seems like this is too good to be true. And so we move ourselves outside. And how can we do that? Well, because God's love is so powerful. It says nothing can separate us from it, right? Yet he gave us the key. And that's my free will. <laughs> Nothing can separate me from this amazing thing except for me. I can unlock that lock and I can step out. And what has happened, I believe, in the lives of myself and so many believers is we got scared at what it would mean to live like this. What do you mean? Sell all my possessions and go follow Jesus? No, they just, that is a, um, that's, no, that's not what God meant right? He's just saying, I want you to have the attitude that you're willing to do that, okay? So that's good enough. I mean, he wouldn't really ask you to do that. I mean, aside from the fact that he asked all the disciples to just do that. But anyway, he wouldn't ask you to do that. And so we step out here and we, we say, no, that is too much. I would rather just sit close to God's presence, and so I, I, I get a taste of it at church on Sundays or maybe a moment where I feel like it's close and personal when I'm having a devotional or maybe I'm at a retreat or I'm up in the mountains and I, I grab a bit of this goodness and I say, oh, that'll be good. And I try to grab that light, but the moment I, I grab it and try to step, it's already gone. It doesn't last. And so we spend our time, keep coming back, and we write worship songs, we sing, and we're like, Jesus, I need you, Jesus, I need you. And he's like, I already did everything for you, right? What you need now is my dad, okay? And you, you have access to him freely. So just step back in. And that's why I think scripture also calls this a refining fire, right? Like it is solid, it is light, but it also burns away that which just shouldn't be there. And that is, as that is burned away and as I get to know and receive God's love, and we said that is the first thing that has to happen when we come into God's presence is we have to actually receive it. What happens next is it is so good, it does not want to stay inside you. And God says, okay, that agape love, I'm ready for you to offer it to somebody else. And we talked about how there, that's a huge misconception in Scripture to say that you and I cannot love somebody the way that God loves somebody. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the fullness of the living God in us, which means that we can absolutely love somebody the way that God wants us to. Okay? We'll probably um, fail because several times we'll try to do it and, and some of ourselves will creep in, but it does not mean that the possibility does not exist, right? And so if we sit in God's presence long enough, we start loving others by nature. I don't have to just obey and be like, oh, I'll be nice to this person today and I'll do these good things. I, I think I kind of want to. I think I want to live this way. It is good. And then what happens is as I receive God's love and as I start to give God's love, the, the strangest thing is I start to know who God is finally. You don't know God through reading the Bible and memorizing every single verse in it, though that'd be really, really good to do. You don't know God by dissecting the verses and jumping into the Greek and getting yourself multiple PhDs in what this thing might mean. We know God by being in His presence, just like that's how you know your spouse, by being in their presence, right? Right? except we get to know God far deeper and far greater. And so that was our first week. And then we said, if we stay here and we can allow that love to start coming through us and we um, 
and we're doing those things and we're coming to know God, here's what's going to happen. Life is going to keep going on around us. And life is messy. It is dirty. It has problems. We have, you know, and so there's chaos and there's, you know, the world itself is broken. So there's trauma going on and, and there's natural disasters. But then, you know, you don't have to go far to turn on the TV to say, this world is getting messed up. And I don't care what your political opinion is. It's getting really messed up, right? And so there's all these things. I've got finances over here, and I've got relationships over here, and I've got my job over here, and I've got my kids over here, and I need to control all these things. And so like the disciples in the boat, the waves are going on. You're sitting in God's presence. The Bible says he's literally just taken a nap, right? Head down because he knows he's God and he has absolute power and authority. And we're like, wake up, God, you have to fix this. And so we spend so many of our prayers saying, God, I need you to do this, right? I need you to fix this. I need you to take care of this. God, you know my boss and you know my wife and you know my children and I need you to do all these things. And, and so we're asking God to do these big miracles, to step out and say, peace, be still, and miraculously, everything in our life. And when it doesn't happen that way, like that, we start trying to control it ourselves. And it just gets messy. And it just, it, it's not the life we want to live because we know that we are, there's like this unsettledness in us. And what God is saying is, I need you to do something. The first choice was you had to put yourself in my presence. Okay? The second choice is you have to stay there. So here's another choice. So now, if, if I say, no matter what, I'm not going to run. No matter what happens, no matter how intense it gets, I'm going to choose God's presence instead of trying to control it. I'm going to choose God's presence instead of trying to fix it. That's a choice of my will. And in doing so, I find peace. Like this deep, abiding it is well with my soul. The world can be chaotic out here, but this circle is very good. And, and here's what weirdly happens, is when I make that choice, and I have to make it at a core level. You can't say maybe today, but depends on how hard tomorrow is. I might jump out again. You say, no, I choose this, right? And if you take a moment where you unlock it and you jump out again, you just get right back in and hook yourself back in for the long haul. I am going to cling. The Bible says cling to truth, right? I'm going to hold tight to this. What happens is, is God changes the person who's on the inside. And suddenly my problems don't seem as crazy and big. I have peace, not because my coworker, my wife, my finances, or everything else changed, but because I changed by saying, I'm going to stay with him through this instead of me fixing it. And what, I, what you find is God is really good at providing for my needs. I might have lost a few of my wants along the way, but he's really good at providing for my needs. He keeps his promise, and I have peace. And so it's weird because you can literally say, you know what? It is so good right here. I am enjoying God's presence. God loves me. Life is not the way I would like it right now. Yet I'm okay with how it is today. And that's a tough statement. But it is such a freeing statement, right? Because it's not on me anymore. 
Now it's on this creator who says, I have so much power. If God is for you, who could possibly stand against you? I have bound myself to him. He's going to take care of it. He's going to take care of it. And, and I'll probably need some help from my spouse and from other believers to, you know, because I'm really good at trying to get out here and fix it on my own. And they'll slap me in the face and say, this is where you choose to be, right? Let's pray right now. <laughs> Let's put you back in God's presence and you find peace. Now, if you stay in God's presence and receive his love, offer his love, experience peace, the next and the best thing the conclusion to all of God's presence is you experience joy. So when I say the word joy, though, what do we think about? Can we give me a definition of joy? This is like the body being interactive instead of just sitting in a seat, and right? What, what is joy? Beyond circumstance, okay? What else is joy? I don't see us experiencing it in this moment right now. I can tell you that. So we're doing a good job of the antithesis of joy. Right? Okay? So joy is not necessarily happiness because happiness is crazy fleeting. Right? I can be happy when I come home and Jen made tacos. That can give me a moment of happiness. Right? But that, that moment of happiness usually passes just about the same time the tacos do, right? And so that is gone. And so it's, it's not something small and temporary like that. What is it? Do you guys know that the word joy in Scripture is a derivative of another Bible word? It's a derivative of a Bible word that is so core to our existence, okay? The word is grace. Grace, okay? So the exact, and I know this sounds weird when somebody talks Greek, you know, your brain wants to shut off. Hold on for just a sec. Hold on for just a second. Grace, undeserved, unmerited favor with God. It's what made everything possible, right? It's what gives us God's presence. The word joy, the Bible word for joy, not the Bible word for happiness, not the Bible word for pleasure, but the Bible word for joy that is found only in God, is, its root word is grace. Which I just think blows my heart away to think that joy only comes in God's presence. Like He's, he's making it very simple for us. It's not found anywhere else. And yet, as human beings, we spend so much time trying to find joy, right? We seek it out. We think, I'll find it in this person that I'm going to love someday or that will love me back. I'll find it in this activity that I'm going to do. I'll find it in my career and climbing a ladder. I'll find it in my pocketbook and in achieving and in getting so much stuff. And like Solomon in Ecclesiastes... We find that most of that, in fact, all of that, tends to be meaningless, right? We don't find joy. And so we start to think that, well, maybe it's not really even attainable, right? It's this Bible word about something that's weird and mysterious, but you're never going to really get there because joy, that's not what was meant for our lives. I've heard people try to sum it up to say that joy is just happiness that just continues forever. Um, it's, a, it's a constant good feeling. And I'm going to say today that joy is just about as mysterious as God's presence. I can't define it for you. It's an indescribable word. Actually, it's an indescribable experience. Right? Right? It's like trying to take the very best moment you ever had in your entire life that was deeply internal, that created all these feelings, and then share it with someone else in a, in a way that they would have the exact same experience. You just can't do it, right? And so I'm not going to waste my time <laughs> trying to. I'm going to tell you what Scripture says, though. Okay, Here's what the Bible tells us 
First in Psalm 16, and we read that earlier, it says, You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In Ephesians 3.19 it says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There seems to be this concept here of fullness of God being filled and fullness of joy all coming together. Proverbs 10.28 says, The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. And Romans 15.13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Here's a movie, a really old one. And when I say this line, some of you are going to know the movie and others of you are just going to think I'm really old. It's about a guy who really enjoyed running. And his sister wanted him to quit running and go back to the mission field. And he looked at her and he said, you don't understand. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. I want you to think about that for a second. Not what gives you pleasure in life, but where in life do you feel God's pleasure? Do you just feel, again, this deep abiding, you can't quite explain it, but it is good, and it is you, and it is a creator, and it is found only here. Sometimes people find that in nature and, and out there in, in the creation that God made. And it actually says in Scripture that, that creation is going to scream and speak to us of the goodness of God, right? Uh, sometimes we find that in, in something unique that God put within us, That when we go and we practice it, when we live in his presence and we allow ourselves to to exist this way, I feel God's pleasure. I feel this intense goodness coming from God. We can feel it when we um, put somebody else first and when we sacrifice and when we love, when we live in this presence of God and we say, I'm just going to show you exactly what God had showed me. We feel God's pleasure, right? When we get out of the way and we say, no longer me but you, God, we feel God's pleasure. And the lie from Satan is that's that's meant to just be momentary. And I just don't see that here. It says that I've come so that your joy may be complete, so it may be full, so you may fully experience this, okay? Okay? But it says, the hope of the righteous, so I need to be living the right way, will be, well, find joy, that God will fill me with all of this joy, that in his presence there is all of this joy. And I have come to this simple truth that the more that I stay here and the more I grow in my knowledge of the goodness of God, the more I look at this world and I say, God is good. He is really good. Ah, today didn't go the way I wanted it to. There was chaos going on outside here. I had to latch myself on pretty tight today. But God is good. And as my faith in the goodness of God increases, my pleasure in his presence does as well. People spend their whole lives trying to find joy. And you won't locate it on any map. And you won't find it with anything you try to possess. But it can be experienced in God's presence. It is the end result of a life lived in God's presence. Not the end result like I'm dying going to heaven right now, right? But it's the result of just making this continual choice every day. So it's taking one more... really easy to tell that apparently I overbought the bike locks for our family, right? 
Pocatello, Idaho is a very dangerous place. If I sit in God's presence, I experience God's love, I don't run from it. I stay here no matter what is going on outside me. I latch myself to God saying, I'm not going to go. I am not going to control. I am going to trust you. I experience peace. I continue to do that. Every day I wake up, I let God flood me with his love, and I say, okay, point me in the direction so that I can let it out today. And God make me better and better at that. And I believe fully that this begins first in your home. If we can't agape love our spouses and our kids, you're not going to do it to a stranger, right? And agape love will take a while for us to learn. We have the ability because of the Holy Spirit, but it is going to take a while to undo a transactional love, which is what most of us exist in. You do this for me, so I do this for you. And agape love says, I love you just because you exist. I want the best for your day because God wants the best for your day. You didn't smile at me today. You were mean to me today. You let me down today. I want the best for your day because God wants the best for your day. And that is so hard. And the temptation is, whenever we're in those moments, is to jump out over here into self and say, hey, you didn't meet my needs. And it causes a fight and an argument. And God says, stay put because I'm sufficient for you. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty much more than sufficient for you. I'll love you enough when the person next to you isn't giving you the love that you think you need. I'll love you enough when the person I'm calling you to love is responding in a way that is not loving. I'll take care of you. Just stay. Stay. And there can be tears in those moments, and God's good at wiping away tears right? It can be hard. There can also be happiness. There can be joy. There can be like, it was so exciting today to make somebody, days, somebody else's day better. I mean, think, think back to the last time you did something that was selfless for somebody, but you got to either witness firsthand or you got to hear about the reaction that that caused within their heart. I think like when you watch a little kid's party, right? Um, Grace just had her birthday party. And, you know, as parents, it's really selfless to have a party with like a dozen kids at a pool um, in a hotel that's loud and noisy. And, and the children don't realize that. Um, but it required a whole lot of God's presence. And, but when you do something selfless where you just, you give a gift and, and yeah, that's, that's small, like a gift to a small child. It can be something so much bigger, like um, when you're providing and meeting the need in somebody else's life and they don't even know you did it. But when you get to see the change and the shock and the awe in that, holy cow, what was just given to me, right? Um, that's good. That is just like a divine moment where God says, I told you to stay put. And so there's moments of happiness and joy in his presence, right? And, and there's moments of happiness and joy when we never get to see the result, but we know God is so good that something good will come from it. That I simply obeyed today and I did what was right. And so being here can be an amazing experience. And so if we stay and we experience that peace and we keep doing this day after day, we begin to experience God's pleasure. And we find his pleasure in just our day hanging out with him. We find his pleasure maybe in we're riding a bike out through the middle of nowhere and it's just God and I. Or like the gentleman from the show, I'm, I'm just taking a run and I'm in God's presence, right? We find God's pleasure in the relationships that we now have because I'm interacting with the Holy Spirit inside of you, not just you, I'm speaking to your heart, right? We find God's pleasure in this right here, guys, in the body of believers getting together and saying, I'm not alone anymore. 
I've got people with me. And that becomes a joy they, that the world can't steal. They can't take it because the world cannot penetrate this circle. They have no access here. Their words just bounce right off. Their actions cannot touch us because my God is greater. My God is stronger, right? My God is more powerful than anything. And, and what was the song that we sang in church when I was growing up? I'm trading my sorrows, right? I'm laying them down for what? The joy of the Lord, right? And to trade our sorrows for the joy of the Lord means to just put ourselves in God's presence. And you will have that experience. And so today, what I'd like us to do is just put ourselves in God's presence again. Over the last few weeks, we have talked about that. And in God's presence, we desire to know and to be known. We experience God's love and we are undone and we are remade at the same time. We experience God's peace and we find that it is well with my soul. And we experience God's joy. We say, life is good. Oh, life is so very good because my God is good. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually disrupt church a little bit. And, and I'm going to just say, let's spend some time with the person who came here today. Spend some time with us. And I don't know where you're at, right? Maybe you're on the outside just barely looking in, okay? Maybe you're soaking up God's love and you're just getting ready to finally let it pour out of you. And you need to have the courage to start loving in an agape style, okay? God will provide all those no matter where you're at. Maybe you're finally getting to know him. The Bible's making sense because you're reading it through the eyes of love instead. Maybe you are needing to stay put because there's chaos on the outside and you're a control freak, right? And you just need to say, I choose peace. Maybe you have done those things and you're going well and it's okay. It is totally okay for Christians to not frown all the time. And to say, I choose the joy of the Lord. Life is good. Right? The world cannot touch me. People cannot do things to me because I get to walk with the living God. And so I choose joy today because my God is good. I don't know where you're at, but I know God's presence is right here. And so we're going to listen to a song um, I don't know if you know it or not. If you want to worship during that, that's your call. If you just want to move yourself slowly into God's presence, and then we're going to have just a few minutes of silence because I believe that in silence, God accomplishes a lot more than in our noise. And then we'll close just telling God that he's good.
in silence. I'm so grateful that worship can bring us into his presence. But in his presence, I think what he calls us to do is to just listen. And we're a noisy world. So for the next few minutes, we're just going to listen. Listen. 